Hello, and welcome to Washington Post Live. I'm Yasmina Boutalib, a health policy reporter here at The Post. Today's guest is Dr. Deborah Burks, who is the White House Coronavirus Response Coordinator in the Trump administration. She joins us to talk about her new book, Silent Invasion, the untold story of the Trump administration, COVID-19, and preventing the next pandemic before it's too late. Today, she will share her inside perspective on the White House in 2020 and the public health challenges the United States and the world face, not just with the current COVID-19 pandemic, but with the next public health crisis. We want you to be part of the conversation, so please share your questions or comments at, with the handle at Post Live. Dr. Burks, thanks so much for joining us today. Good to see you, Yasmin. And again, congratulations on your book. I'm just so impressed by how you were able to pull this together. Having now done my own, I know how difficult it was. Thank you so much. That really means a lot. Well, we're here to talk about your book today, so I want to dive right in. Why did you decide now was the moment to tell your story? Well, unless you really understand what was going on, what was what everyone could see, but what was happening underneath the surface, you can't understand what needs to be fixed over the next few months to really ensure that we're ready for each of these surges. So I wanted to be really clear on what really happened and what needs to be done as these surges continues and to get us ready for the next pandemic. So it's very solution oriented. There's a nine page appendix at the back that really talks about legislation that is needed. It's not just about more money, but it's focusing the money in a way that will have the greatest impact. And I wanna dive into a lot of the details of your book, but I wanna just take a moment to take us back to the beginning of the pandemic, because there are still a lot of questions about what China did and didn't know at the start. I know this was before you had joined the administration, but what do we know now that China knew that it wasn't sharing in real time as the US and other countries were trying to figure out what to make of this? Well, I think they knew that they had an explosive infectious disease, um, an explosive respiratory infectious disease that was spreading rapidly in one region of their country. And I think from my mind, looking at the data very early on and even um, looking at YouTube videos and others, it was clear that there was human to human transmission and that this virus was highly contagious and highly infectious, making it very different from the original SARS virus and the original MERS virus. And I think that information would have been critical to the world, this human to human rapid spread and transmission, because that's how we gauge what needs to be done in really real-time terms. And what did you make of the administration's response and the public health community's response in those first days and weeks of the, of the response before you had joined the administration? Well, it's so interesting because one part of the White House, the part of the White House that I have worked, I had worked with, which was in the NSC, the Africa Bureau of the NSC, I'm going to them and telling them, this is very serious. Please get a meeting of all the African diplomats that are in Washington. I want them to know, one, how serious this is, but they have solutions. We're there to stand shoulder to shoulder with them. And a lot of the investments we had made over the years in healthcare delivery and in the laboratories were the key components that I believe were going to be essential to the response of this new virus. And so. I'm meeting with all the African diplomats the end of January, and we'll, we're still talking about the risk to Americans being low. I, I want to talk a, a little bit about President Trump, because obviously that's such a big part of your book and such a big part of your experience when you were part of this response. So what was the most important message you wanted to convey about President Trump in your book? I think that early on after I got there um, and I had my list of immediate to do items that first week, um, the vice president and the White House staff immediately proceeded down my list. That's why we had a meeting immediately with all of the laboratory um, developers on that Wednesday. 
Thursday, we went to see what really was happening on the ground um, in Washington and to find out what we could do about masks and PPE. And that's why we went to the 3M plant. So there was a lot of action that first week. And then, of course, I realized that there wasn't really any source of accurate data and the data um, streams that were coming in that were there were extraordinary delayed and incomplete. Um, and so we set a wrap about really putting together new data streams so that we could see the virus because I knew it was invisible. I knew it was asymptomatic. And I really wanted us to have a comprehensive response. And so very early on, all of those elements about my concern of asymptomatic spread, it persisting in the environment indoors in an aerosolized form and making it highly contagious, those first weeks and the establishment of data, I felt like we were getting the White House to a place where they were taking this very seriously. And that series of events from the European travel ban to the 15 days to slow the spread to the 30 days to slow the spread, I felt like we were really moving forward together as a unified group of task force and the administration and the White House to really alert the American people to how serious this virus was. Now, we were already 60 to 90 days behind, but I really felt that there was a level of seriousness for those first three or four weeks. And as I describe in the book, that rapidly deteriorated in April. And I mean, how much of that do you attribute to the president? What was your overall impression or what do you think is important for people to know about how he operated? Because obviously this this sort of came from the top down. Yeah, I think the number one issue was um, obviously I was finally getting data streams up and running and I was doing very um, mathematical. I love math. So I was doing some deep dive mathematical projections on what we could expect in the United States. That's how we came up with that 100,000 to 240,000 in that first surge. And I just want to be clear to everyone, we only mapped that first surge in that first um, number of fatalities. And that was the 100,000 as if we did things really quite perfectly. There was a group then in the White House, in fact, I think there were several groups on, in the White House um, as part of the internal economic team who were taking that same data and making a different set of assumptions and then taking them to the president and saying that Debbie and the task force's projections are off by a factor of four. We think it's only 26,000 Americans that will die. If you remember, that took us full circle back to what I was trying to prevent. That put us back into what they believed was the annual flu deaths, even though we don't really know precisely the annual flu deaths, those are modeled. But that 26,000, I think, is what really resulted in derailing the president's confidence in the data that I was presenting him. So, I mean, you you joined in year four of the Trump administration. So by then it was pretty well established how the president ran the White House and you know, that sometimes he ignored evidence that was right in front of him. So knowing all of that, what were you prepared for when you entered the White House and what made you decide to still join? Well, um, I you put it perfectly <laughs> because, you know, I could see all of that from the outside um, and I would work very hard to protect the PrEP bar program. Um, we were making really incredible advances in HIV, TB and malaria. Um, really around HIV and the, and the president's emergency plan for AIDS relief, which is a bipartisan program, which I just want to remind people when we want to do something big and we want to do something bold and we want to do something that has an impact, it often has to cross multiple presidential administrations and multiple leadership in Congress. And so it really needs to be bipartisan in nature. That's when we do our absolutely most incredible best work. And But what you describe is exactly why I said no no, no, um, when they were asking me to come to the White House in January and February. Now, remember, in traditional White Houses, over in the ex executive office building, there are often detailees that are civil servants like myself. We are not, um, everybody in the civil service is technically part of an administration, but we are not political. And so I felt like I could say no until I could. After the Diamond Princess, I knew two things. One, they were still un underestimating the silent spread. 
two, that it was much more persistent in the air than they believed, and three, that tsunami wave was headed to the United States, and I just felt like I couldn't sit on the sidelines and watch that happen. Were there moments you can recall where you felt like the president put the country at risk or made decisions that were, you know, against the evidence for the sake of his reelection bid? You know, I think pandemic responses by polling are very dangerous, um, extraordinarily dangerous. And I worry as a country, we're slipping further and further into that framework that we can tackle pandemics by wishful thinking, by our polling, rather than what we know are critical public health tools and what we need to do as individuals and as a country. And I felt like those four weeks where we had that intense seriousness um, devolved into, and it started with that, we're gonna be open by Easter. Of course, we prevented that, but um, the Liberate Michigan, I mean, it was just a series. It was clear to me by um, the, the middle of April that um, the president's attention was elsewhere and it continued that way. On the other hand, the vice president's attention remained firmly engaged and there were others in the White House helping us execute a comprehensive response. And so, but in any pandemic, to be absolutely clear, the most important thing is consistent communication based on evidence where you're showing the evidence to the American public. So they're learning with you about what you're seeing and why you're asking them to do certain things. But communication is the backbone of public health and, a, and an effective public health response. And we lost the president's communication and focus on this um, by the beginning of April. I mean, that must have been difficult. And it, and it kind of leads me to, to what I want to talk about next, which is to give you a chance to respond to some of the criticism that you've received for some of the, the things that um, happened in 2020 and your role in the response. One of those is um, something that was reported in April 2020, where it was reported that you had told the president the pandemic would soon end. And I'm, I'm hoping you can talk to us about what you did say to the president and how it impacted his response. And of course, as you just told us, that um, overlapped with this time period where his attention had really turned elsewhere. He had tweeted about liberating these states. So it was all of this was happening at a moment where he's shifting elsewhere. So, of course, I did not say that to the president. But, you know, I just want to be clear. I made a decision when I was going to go into the White House that I couldn't put any effort into defending myself. When um, I can't tell you how it was important to stay focused 24 seven on the data um, and not get distracted by other things going on. And so I, I do believe, and I say that in the book, and we, of course, I have these memos um, that CEA um, is the one who told the president that the um, pandemic was not nearly as I portrayed it, and we were only going to lose 26,000 Americans. So then I said to the ta then I said to the vice president's office and everyone else, where did you get this conceptual framework that I was saying things were better? Because every day. I wrote a full report um, that included about 35 graphics evidence of the data on what was happening county by county, major metro by major metro across this United States. And so throughout April, I of course have all of those and I have summaries of all of those and, and all of them now are in the National Archives, over 300 of these daily reports. And so I looked through April and the April 11th one that they often will cite said the first bullet is finally things are improving in the New York metro area. And this was important because we needed to shift resources and ventilators to the cities that were deteriorating. And right after that, it talked about the cities that were in log and um, exponential growth of this virus. And it talked about Boston, it talked about Philadelphia, it talked about Washington, DC, and it talked about Detroit, Chicago, um, Houston, and Dallas. And so I, I don't think anyone could have interpreted anything that I said throughout my stay in the White House and throughout this last year, where I still track the data every single day, 
um, could ever say that I underestimated or implied that the epidemic was over. The epidemic is not over today, um, and it wasn't over then. There are laws when things get better, like May 2020, May 2021, and what I predict to be May 2022, but that is followed by a significant surge somewhere in the country, usually the South, um, in July and August. Well, I actually, I want to ask you about those data reports. So you compiled a, a special team or put together a special team to compile these reports where, like you said, you were looking at the data and doing risk assessments uh, down to the county level. And anyone who didn't already know this about you can tell from this interview that you were laser focused on the data. And you've talked a lot about the need for transparency in the data. So what was your thinking in those those reports were not publicly released in 2020. So why not release those as you were compiling them since it was such important information for the country to understand where the pandemic was and how it was progressing. So throughout March, that's what you saw when we did the daily briefings. So I brought that data to the American people in that very clear way. Um, we also wrote um, so I'm thinking throughout March and early April that the administration is going to continue to use data and we're going to continue to drive. And then, of course, things go in a very different direction and very focused then on finding a way to communicate effectively to the American people. And that's when um, the vice president helped me go to the states, but at the same time in early June, writing daily, weekly reports that included the same comprehensive uh, analysis, county by county, metro by metro, for each of the states that went to the governor's team. That was about 30 to 40, 50, people per state that received that weekly report. And of course, that was followed with um, continuous um, in-person and phone calls to each of the states. Um, I've had to do this in my battling of pandemics around the globe when looking at HIV, Ebola, or Zika, and that sometimes the president or prime minister is not adequately engaged, and then you have to find another way. You don't give up. You don't turn your back on it. You don't say it's too hard. Hard, um, you find another way and often um, in sub-Saharan Africa and throughout Asia, I'll work then with provincial governors or even local mayors and district councils to really um, ensure that we have the right policy to save the most lives. What, with, with those reports, so like you said, you were they were being presented publicly during those briefings in March. Was someone actively blocking them from being released after that or after April? There was a um, direct blocking of releasing the governor's report and putting up the comprehensive data analysis that you just described. And finally, um, out of continuous frustration and to make sure that it was available to the Biden administration, we quietly put up the HHS community profile um, which is very similar to the data we collected, just in a more abbreviated form every day. And that's still up today and being updated about four to five days a week. And so if you go to HHS Community Profile COVID, the state reports are there as well as um, this community-based um, report where you can see each county in the United States and know what's happening. I still would like it to be more granular. I, I believe it's critically important to track new admissions by age group, race, and ethnicity so that we really understand who's still at severe, a significant risk for severe disease and the same with fatalities. Um, I don't believe we're displaying the, the data in a granular and rapid enough time frame. We shouldn't be reporting on January fatalities the end of April. People should see that in real time. I think if they had seen hospitalizations in real time, they would have realized that a significant number of vaccinated fully vaccinated individuals were being hospitalized over the holidays. So I, I, I want to ask you about a moment I know you've been asked about a lot the last couple of days because one of the, the main points of criticism was not standing up to the president when he contradicted medical and scientific advice. And I think the, the moment, of course, that you've been asked about a lot is on April 23rd, 2020, when Trump, you know, publicly mused about using bleach as a as a disinfectant or as a means to treat the virus. 
In your book, you wrote that I looked down at my feet and wished for two things, something to kick and for the floor to open up and swallow me whole. And then you had told ABC News, frankly, I didn't know how to handle that episode. I still think about it every day. I'm wondering if you've thought about how you would have wanted to do that moment differently or if there was a way to handle it differently. Well, in talking to ABC, and that's why I love dialogue, because, you know, other people have different insights that really allow you um, to understand how to do things better. Um, um, I never made that same mistake again, and I don't try to make the same mistake twice. I try to learn from those. I did say not a treatment. I think what was very difficult for me is having been military and your commander in chief is standing there. He wasn't talking to me. He was talking to the DHS scientists. Um, so he was turned at a complete right angle to me. Um, in other words, I couldn't catch his eye. I couldn't shake my head. I couldn't be like, what are you doing? I couldn't send any nonverbal signals about how, and that's why I was looking at the floor because I could not figure out how to get his attention. And frankly, the DHS scientist was encouraging this line of dialogue, which is another thing I couldn't understand in any way, because that DHS scientist was there for a sole reason, to do the research that we had asked for in task force to convince parents that playgrounds were safe. And so it was a comparison between known disinfectants and sunlight, which we know produces hydroxy radicals and other um, um, free radicals that do disinfect and kill membranes of the virus. So I'm thinking that this is an opportunity to tell the American people that it's safe to take their children outside because I was very distressed that play playgrounds were closed and I knew outside was safe. And so how that became this, I didn't understand until I left the meeting and obviously I pushed very, back very hard. That's why the president said the next day he was joking. Of course, we went to CDC and FDA so they could also put up alerts, but that did not have to happen. And, and I think it, it illustrates the difficulty in this White, White House where there was a lack of discipline around access to the president and access to the president's information um, not being portrayed in a um, comprehensive manner. Certainly, if I had been in the Oval Office when they had started that dialogue, I would have been able to prevent this from happening. But I think ABC well, gave me a great insight in that she said, well, maybe you could have stepped between them. And you know, that hadn't occurred to me before. I was only thinking of going you know, to the podium. I wasn't thinking of stepping between the dialogue. Um, and I think that would have been the right thing to do. Well, that was of course, one of many, many difficult moments you faced. And you, you talked a lot about this, this pact you had made with some of the other doctors on the task force. Um, you know, when you were sort of pushed out of the response and you turned your efforts to the states. At, at any point, did you think to yourself or, or have a sort of bright line that if crossed by the president or if he had asked something of you, you would quit? Was there that bright line in your mind throughout all of this? Um, I always, my line was if at that point he interfered with my ability to discuss with the governors what precisely they needed to be doing to control this pandemic state by state, if he had interfered with that critical dialogue, because remember, I had already stepped back and I wasn't allowed to go out on national media. So the next critical piece to me and what I had done on the ground so many times in Africa and Asia was to get to community level, understand what is happening there. It's the same reason the Washington Post has people in the Ukraine. I mean, there's data and there's computers and then there's reality on the ground and you really need that reality on the ground. If he had interfered with what I was saying to the governors and a lot allowing me to go out, that would have been a red line because that would have cut, cut off what I believed was an effective way, an alternative way to get the information out. And I know you said, you know, you couldn't spend too much time defending yourself in 2020, but, you know, with time having passed, I'm sure you can see there's still a lot of anger about the Trump administration response and the people who were part of it, um, including you. And I'm wondering how you respond to all of that, because I can't imagine that that's been easy. 
You know, um, I have every confidence um, that the materials that sit in the National Archives, that when the the definitive story is written about this pandemic, um, I will be seen very differently. And that's okay. I, I mean, I understand people's anger about the pandemic. I'm angry now. I'm angry now that we are still losing Americans every single day. Um, I do not find it acceptable to, and I hear this all the time, oh, the people who are dying are unvaccinated. I, I don't care what they are. That is our job as public health officials to fix that and do whatever it takes to fix that. Um, and if it means that you need to make sure that 100% of them have access to immediate testing and effective antivirals that we have right now, no one should be dying at this rate any longer with the tools that we have. So yes, I, I was upset then, I remain upset today because I believe that we're not utilizing what we have to save American lives. So we have a Twitter question in our last couple of minutes. Um, this is from W. Alsmeyer Johnson, who asks, could you share how likely a new surge of a variant will be over the summer, fall, or winter? Okay, so I want everybody that can hear my voice to go um, to one of the international COVID sites. And I want you to look at South Africa. Um, I use a couple of different sites, either Our World and Data or Worldometer, and look at the Republic of South Africa and look at the periodicity of their surges. Um, I know that another surge is coming and will be coming across the world because every four to six months in South Africa where 50 to 60% of the population is infected with every single surge and every different variant, um, there's no protection and there's no long lived natural immunity. And when there's no long lived natural immunity, and the vaccine is based on natural infection, the va current vaccines will not be durable to protect against infection. Um, there's still evidence that it protects against severe disease. So in this very moment, you can, and this is what I was waiting for to see, South Africa cases are once again rising, despite having 60 to 70% of their population infected with each surge. So no one in the United States should be confident that because people are saying 60 to 70% of the Americans have antibody. That's true in South Africa, and it didn't prevent the surges. So although we're improving in our ability to control to severe disease and hospitalization, there are a lot of Americans, particularly those over 70 and those with immunodeficiency, 35 million Americans are over 70, don't have effective immunity to this virus and therefore are still susceptible to severe disease. And we have to figure out who they are. We need a correlates of protection and we need to be boosting based on that number. I'm telling you, it'd be like treating diabetes without knowing people's glucose levels or hemoglobin A1C. So Dr. Burks, we have about two minutes left. So I wanna ask one more audience question that actually dovetails quite a bit with, with a, a central premise of your book, which is that you said you wanted to document what was happening so we could learn, you know, what the biggest mistakes were and also what went right that wasn't seen. And so Claudette Ettenberg from New York asks, what could we have done better? Claudette, what a great question. And that's what I talk about in the solution part and in the appendix. Um, Clearly, we engaged the private sector late, and the private sector was willing and, and so willing to help us, and they did, um, but they weren't really brought in in any significant way until March, and they helped us with PPE, they helped us with testing, they were already working on therapeutics and vaccines. So just imagine if we had been moving together since January. I think the biggest thing to me is, is transparency and data and comprehensive data collection. And today, we sit in the same place with inadequate data in real time to go to, to data-driven decision-making. And that's inexcusable in our type of technology. The, the data is available electronically. The hospitals, clinics, and laboratories would be willing to provide it in real time. It has to be harnessed. It has to be transparent. It has to be up so every American can see what's happening in their community. And we have to make those tools available to every single American. And we need to use that same kind of data 
to tackle obesity, diabetes, hypertension, and remove the barriers to access both in the urban areas and in the rural areas. You can see that people are dying in the rural areas, not just because they're unvaccinated. It's because they don't have adequate access to the kind of technology and healthcare needed to combat this virus. Well, we're unfortunately out of time. I know we had a lot more questions for you, but Dr. Burks, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much. And Congress, read the appendix. We've got to change. As always, thank you for joining us. I'm Yasmina Boutalib. To see what programs we have coming up, you can have a, head over to WashingtonPostLive.com. Uh, thanks for joining.